Welcome, it's awesome to be here. So just to quickly uh, introduce myself, my name's Pete Langham. Um, I'm the Domain Chapter Lead for Data Engineering at Spark New Zealand, um, and joined on stage by Adil, who's a, a Chapter Lead in the Data Science and Machine Learning space. Um, so he's got all the smarts, but uh, hopefully I can, uh, can do my best as well. Um, skip through the agenda really quick, we'll get to that soon anyway. So who is Spark? Um, we are in no way associated with Apache Spark, so if anyone's come here to find out about the latest in distributed processing with Spark, I do apologise, you're in the wrong place. Um, we are in fact New Zealand's largest telco and digital services provider. I had to throw that in because we do have a competition sitting down the front here as well, so thanks for coming Johnny, appreciate it. Um, so yeah, as you can see, we do have a, a purpose, I guess we like to think that we're trying to do something bigger than, than just our own company, um, which is to help all of New Zealand win big in a digital world. Um, so that's all around how can we actually help our country succeed on a global stage. So pretty amazing to be here at an event like this um, in uh, support of that purpose, I guess. I had a look at the metrics on the side there, so uh, two and a half million mobile connections probably doesn't sound like a lot uh, on a global scale, but keep in mind we've only got five million people in New Zealand, so it is a, a reasonable market share. Um, so our Snowflake journey to date, so we were early adopters, I guess, of Snowflake in our region. Um, so when we first started talking to Snowflake back in 2018, there weren't actually any Snowflake employees in New Zealand, um, so we had a couple flying from Australia to have some initial conversations. We then signed up as customers in 2019, um, and since then, I guess, uh, like a lot of companies, we had a whole raft of legacy on-premise systems, um, so pretty proud to say that we've actually fully exited uh, all of those now, we're fully in the Snowflake Data Cloud, so that's our enterprise data warehouse, our big data cluster that we have running in Hadoop. Um, we had an analytics appliance on the teaser, as well as a, a data quality system. Um, so for the past few years, we've been working through uh, getting all of that onto Snowflake and, and being extremely successful. I won't spend too long on this one. This is just, I guess, some of the drivers of change uh, and some of the things that we've been able to realize. Probably very similar to most other companies, right? I'm sure if you put the same list up for a lot of companies, it would, would look just about the same. Um, so moving from data silos, uh, issues with performance, contention, scalability, high operational overhead, uh, to obviously solving a lot of that stuff with, with Snowflake. So that is where we've come from. We are obviously at a Snowflake Summit. We've got some of our Snowflake team here, which is awesome to see. Um, they love this stuff, obviously, some numbers in terms of what we've been able to achieve. Uh, so pretty impressive, obviously, in terms of uh, the processing time, so saving sort of 85% uh, on our, our data curation pipelines, around a 90% improvement across some benchmark queries that we've got. Obviously some significant cost savings in there as well compared to some of our old enterprise agreements. And a big one for us, uh, we used to have, have major challenges, I guess, around data timeliness and availability, so the fact that we've got all of our data now ready to go before the start of the business day is a, a big win for our users. So that's just a little bit of context, but I guess what I wanted to talk about today is a particular use case that we've been working through. Before I do that, I'll need to introduce Skinny as well. So Skinny is actually a separate brand within Spark, and that's basically a, a low-cost mobile service. So I think you guys have Mint Mobile or something similar over here um, for sort of that price-conscious uh, consumer segment. So also to mention within Spark, we had built an advanced decisioning engine that we refer to internally as the brain. What that basically is, uh, we had a whole lot of customer uh, models, so predicting things like churn propensity, move address, device purchase, as well as affinity for things like games or sports or music. So on the Spark side, what we've been able to do is actually bring all of that together, um, put it into what, yeah, what we call the brain, and then be able to come up with essentially a next best action. So how can we contact that person with the right message at the right time via the right channel, whether that's SMS or email or, or an app, and avoid spamming a whole lot of people who aren't actually in market at that time. So that had been working really successfully for us on the, the Spark side, but I guess what we didn't have was an equivalent for, for Skinny. So our, our data is actually quite separate between the two brands, so we didn't have all of this, uh, all of the models and everything else that we, um, we do for Spark on the Skinny side. We didn't even have all the, the data, to be fair. So Skinny being just a prepaid service, we didn't collect the same sort of customer data that we do with our Spark brand. But we could see there was a big opportunity there. Like I say, it was, it was working really successfully for us as, as Spark. So we thought, hey, this is something that we really need to be utilizing for our, um, our Skinny customers as well. So the ultimate aim, of course, was to get a better understanding of those Skinny customers to be able to engage with them at the right time, as I mentioned, with, with the right message through the right channel. 
so as mentioned, we, we really needed to build a new end-to-end -end solution for this. There were new data sources that we needed to ingest, um, new features we needed to engineer, obviously new ML models, and then we needed to integrate these into the, the brain. So given this was in some ways a, a greenfield solution, we took the opportunity to sort of look at it and say, hey, could we actually do this in a different way? So we have been using uh, a variety of services. So we're primarily on Azure for our data platforms. Um, so we've been using things like Azure Data Factory, Azure ML. Um, we've used uh, different tools sort of in the, the um, data transformation space as well. But given the, the success that we were getting with Snowflake and some of the new features that we were seeing coming out, we thought, hey, is there an opportunity here that we could actually build out this end-to-end -end solution using some of those new Snowflake features and, and some of the Snowflake partners? And of course, we've got a really great working relationship with our, our local Snowflake team. So they were very happy to, to jump in and support us. So to talk to what we did, firstly, to introduce the team. So um, I'm not going to try and take credit for this work, by the way. I wasn't actually hands-on involved in building this. I'm, I'm just lucky enough to talk about it. Um, but we had just a small four-person team who were actually involved. So we had um, Eric on the top left there as our, our architect and technical lead. Um, Jing is a cloud engineer. Uh, today are doing feature engineering and, and ML models. Um, and then Abby doing data engineering and, and deployment. Um, and on a single page, I guess this is what the solution looks like. So we had some existing curated objects within our skinny data warehouse here, which we had replicated into Snowflake. In addition, there were some new high volume data sets that were identified that were um, coming from the network. We needed to do some feature engineering, which was then ending up in our skinny feature store. From there, we used Snowpark for ML and then ultimately pushed the resulting customer traits across into the brain, uh, which is also running on Snowflake, but, um, but separately. Uh, and then we've got obviously recommendations being generated and we've also got a UI sitting there for our marketers to interact with. I'll, uh, I'll dive into all that in a bit more detail now. Um, so starting with ingestion. So as I mentioned, uh, one of the key data sets that we needed um, was some pretty high volume uh, network data. Uh, so we were getting about a billion rows per day, um, which is obviously reasonably significant. Up until now, as I mentioned, we've been using uh, Azure Data Factory for our data ingestion and uh, orchestration. But we knew that would be a challenge both from a performance and a cost perspective. Um, so we were keen to, to try out Snowpipe. So pretty standard sort of a design pattern there. We have files being generated and then being pushed across into a secure Azure blob storage location. The files are then checked uh, and ingested directly into the skinny data lake in Snowflake. Just to dive a little bit more into how this actually works for anyone who's not super familiar with Snowpipe, as you can hopefully see, we're receiving around 3,000 files per day, uh, which are coming over the course of the day and landing into our Azure Blob Storage location. On the Snowflake side, we then just have a stage set up, which is just a, a pointer to the file location in Azure. Then a notification integration, which is uh, basically just a trigger which fires when a file arrives and kicks off the copy activity into Snowflake. So in terms of what we saw from that and the benefits, I guess, uh, as you would have seen from the last slide, there's really not much to set up. We basically had one developer um, who did some simple configuration and we were up and running. Um, no need for scheduling or anything like that. Secondly, uh, hopefully there's no one from Microsoft in the room. We love Microsoft as well. But uh, one of the big benefits here was the, the cost, like I say, compared to if we had done the same using Azure Data Factory, estimated at around about six times cheaper. And finally, from a performance perspective, from the time the file lands, we've got the data available ready to use in Snowflake in, in less than 10 seconds. All right, so onto feature engineering. So once we had the data, we needed to obviously perform some feature engineering. We had previously taken some different approaches to this. Um, so originally we used um, Databricks and then we'd pivoted and we're using just native Snowflake stored procedures. But recently we've uh, adopted DBT for data transformation. So Using DBT gives us a powerful solution for that data transformation and feature engineering. Very simple diagram, but uh, I'll talk to that in a little bit more detail. So for anyone not familiar with DBT, I'm sure a lot of you are, but quickly to run through, essentially data objects, in this case our feature tables, are defined as models, which is essentially just a, a SQL select statement, so a blueprint essentially of a, a table or view. The model output is then the table itself, um, created within Snowflake. We then have a YAML file to specify model configurations. So that could be a description, unique keys, um, any tests or data contracts that we want to have uh, enforced, um, as well as any pre or, or post hooks. 
um, which are essentially just statements that run before or after the model is built. So in our case, um, we're running some audit statements as a post hook uh, or log into an audit table. And in this case as well, you can see we've defined the model type as incremental, which basically just means that we'll be inserting additional rows into that object rather than doing a sort of truncate and reload. One of the great features of dbt is that we get a whole lot of libraries available out of the box to be able to do uh, data tests as part of our pipelines. So we can run checks for things like null values, uniqueness, um, acceptable domain values. And in addition to this, uh, basically we can define any test. Um, so if we can write a select statement for it, then again we can use that as, a, as an automated test. And we also have the concept of a, a data or model contract, which basically guarantees the format of the data set. Uh, so then where we have multiple models being stringed together, it means that we're not going to break any downstream dependencies. So very quickly, I guess using dbt on Snowflake, again, provided a number of benefits for us. Um, really great in terms of that modularity and, and reusability of code. Just talked about the automated testing and quality control that's built in, which is great in terms of that, that data quality aspect. Nice integration with Git for version control and collaboration. Running natively on Snowflake, obviously, we get that, that same scalability and performance that we used to. Incremental builds and, and out-of-the-box data lineage and documentation as well. So to summarize that, I guess um, one of the key things that we want to have, obviously, with our features is that trust. Um, super important for any data solution, obviously. So with uh, automated testing and, and model contracts, um, we're, we're getting a high level of trust on those features. Again, we're seeing a, a, an improvement in terms of the development speed, which given that we were trying to deliver an end-to-end -end solution um, with a small team in a, a pretty tight time frame was obviously super important. And we also have a unified environment that our data engineers, analysts, data scientists can all work together and, and collaborate in. All right, with that, I will hand over to Adil. Hey, everyone. So I'm um, just myself again. So I'm Adil. I'm a chapter lead uh, in Data Science at Spark. In the next few slides, I'm going to talk you through a little bit about the end-to-end -end machine learning development lifecycle. So just a bit of background. I believe you were one of the first customers that were to try Snowpark. And due to our relationship with the guys here at Snowflakes, we were given the privilege of early access. So going through all the slides, you're going to see how easy it is as a data scientist practitioner to be able to deploy those models. So let's get started. So as Peter talked about, we have a feature store that can contain hundreds and hundreds of um, features that's reusable across our different ML models, um, dashboards, and web apps. And also what that allows us to do effectively is to build on different use cases and, and, and iterate and expand really, really fast across them. So there, as, um, as we described earlier, so you have the DBT process that brings in the, the features in Feature Store, in the skinny Feature Store that's connected to different apps and, and services. The next bit is where did ML fit um, in the grand scheme of things? For us, it was a bit of a leap of, leap of faith. So we used to bring the data to the model. So this time we said we're going to bring the model to the data. It meant that there was no crossing of VPCs or VNet, and it all stayed in the secure Snowflake environment. That meant that the security team was quite happy with the whole thing. So we didn't have to raise a GRA every time we want to move skinny data across into a Spark environment and vice versa. But also it meant that we were trying something a bit new and that was in private preview. Some people were a bit uncomfortable with that. But since we had the support of the guy from, um, from Snowflake, it meant that we could always leverage the expertise when, whenever we were stuck. And we did that a few times. And thank you, Trevor, for helping out on this. So now, how, where does ML fit? And why did we choose to go with Snowpark? So there's a few key considerations that came to mind when we sort of spoke about this internally. First was about the data movement. So we didn't want to move the data at all. We want to keep it in one single place, which meant that it was secure. And as, as Peter showed earlier, it was cost effective as well. And also, there were integrated pipelines in those data movement with your ADF, your MLOps pipeline that can be quite finicky to use. And those of you who have used it in the past, you know how it can be between training and scoring or inference. And also, the compute itself. So running out of memory while you're trying to do a grid search or trying to train a model can be frustrating. So it means you start from scratch again. So it meant now that all of the service that we were trying to leverage for our models was all managed within Snowflake. And we didn't have to worry any about any of this which meant was a significant reduction in time and also in cost altogether. So here I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how easy it is to just go for a few lines of codes to go from a data frame or a snowflake table uh, all the way to a model of registry. 
So a disclaimer here. So while we were doing this, it was still in private uh, preview. So some of those have changed, um, uh, has definitely changed over time. So first and foremost, what we started doing is by configuring the, the access. So we wanted to create a, uh, sorry, configure an access so we can create a session by which we would t take the data from um, a Snowflake table into a, a Snowpark data frame. The next bit here is transforming the data a little bit. So as you know, once you have your data, you want to do some pre-processing, and that requires deduplication, removement of nulls, you know, high correlation. So here I'm just going to walk through you some of those pre-processing steps that you normally go through as a data scientist as part of your day-to-day. -day. So one of them is deduplication. Again, it's the very simple case of the group pie and deduping. And if you were to go in the background and looking at SnowSite, you can actually look at the Snowflake query that the Snowpark operation has been turned into and actually look at the query history and also the visual representation. So that was a good thing for us. It would mean that we could track what was happening, what was using the new tool, and it gave confidence to the team that we were doing the right thing and we, the data they were getting, the number of rows that we were seeing after this operation meant something that it was actually correct. The next bit was one hot encoding. Everyone that dealt with categorical variable, you know, it can be sometimes be a nightmare. So here, if you were to do one-hot encoding, those have used similar Python packages in the past, can relate to how the syntax looks like. And also, depending on the type of model as well, sometimes you might need it or might not need it. And normalization, again, if you're looking at those models, that's those linear model, you want to normalize your data. And again, these were things that didn't take as much time to set up. It was a similar sort of syntax that we've used in the past or calling different function. And for us, and I'm talking about the development team here, they found it really comforting that they were moving between languages that they were very familiar with. So once we've done all of this, we chose XGBoost as the final model that we're gonna be using. So for the purpose of this presentation here, I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about how first we created the model instance. Again, we, we specified the input columns, which are both the numerical and categorical columns, uh, the label column itself, and also the output. Once the model instance was created, then we started with, we fit the model in the train data set, and then predict it on the test uh, set. So once this was done, you can go to your favorite measurement metrics, your F1 score, precision recall, and AUC PR or a AUC altogether. And later on, I'm gonna show you um, in a screenshot of how this was captured for further reference. So now what we tend to do a little bit is once the first model is built, it's not quite the best one. So you want to do some hyperparameter tuning, and that in itself can be quite computationally expensive, and depending on how many, uh, hyper, how many set of hyperparameters you want to tune. Here we had three estimators and learning rate, and real, we realized really early on that this operation can be sped up quite significantly by leveraging the whole parallelization that happens in the background using Snowflake Compute. And also we can scale as we need to be able to make this faster. And then once the grid search was finished, we chose the best model, the most optimal model that was then stored in our, into the model registry. So here in the model registry, we logged certain parameters, such as the model name, version, description, sample data, and again, the model metrics. So for us, it was very important that to keep a model lineage as a whole, to see as we go through different model life cycle, we could track how they were performing across our validation or test set. So again, in the model registry here, you see certain artifacts, model deployment and metadata. And if you go into one of those, like the model metadata, you can see when the model were registered, what type of metrics they output on the test set, and also if the model was deployed or not. And that, for us, was quite important because our stakeholders, over time, have became accustomed to those metrics, and they wanted to go and actually find out what model they were using and also how they were performing. So then now we can give them access to those tables if they need be, and we can actually retrieve that. And then this, you can point it out to do a Streamly dashboard and actually start populating those and track them over time for observability. So once a model has been registered, the next time is to use the model for inference. So where what we do here, we use a user-defined function to achieve this, where we specify the model name, version, and deployment name. And this is as simple as once we created that UDF, you can use that across several things. I've seen in the past how different people have used it. So again, to be able to, to call the model for, for inference, you just need to do the dot predict on the user-defined function, and all of a sudden you will be able to pass in your inference data set or uh, your data set where you want to predict against. Again, depending on the size of the data set, you want, might want to scale your compute, and also due to it being fully parallelized, it means that 
it was quite fast, and also we didn't see any decline in performance from what we used to do previously. And that was a big um, step up for us because the volume of data that Skinny was taking in and crunching down was quite, was quite different from what we were used to doing the other model um, as a whole. So all in all, the whole process was quite fast, and it meant that we sped up the model lifecycle at Spark for the Skinny um, deployment. And going forward, I think we'll be moving more, more and more models on the Snowpark um, framework. So next, I'm going to talk to you about another PSC that we've run using uh, Snowpark Container Services and DBT. So here, we, um, the team wanted to go all in with Snowflake-based offering. And we wanted to, again, give a try to do the Snowpark Container Service and bring our own transformation to uh, the data rather than the data to the compute. So here we work closely with Trevor in creating a PSE and using DBT to be able to achieve so. So why container services is fully managed, means we don't need to worry too much about what's happening in the background. It's easily deployable and scalable. And it's all within the Snowflake boundaries, which means that there was no data crossing again, which, and it's all secure, and also, it's, and also it means that there was little overhead for us to worry about. So I'm just going to walk you through like the three steps in terms of how we achieve this. First, we compile the container and storing within the image registry. Secondly, we deploy the DBT container within the Snowpark DBT container with the Snowpark container, and then run the transformation within the Snowpark uh, Snowflake account. So going into those into a bit more details. So first and foremost, we looked at the interface between the Snowflake and the third party to be able to create a, uh, a secure in integrated connection. Then we sourced out the image registry. And then, again, create the compute pool. For our for use case, we only use the one node, but you can decide how many nodes you're going to use and what type of compute you're going to be using as well. Then the next step was to use, um, to create a Docker file with dbt on it. And here's the configuration of how we did so. Create an entry point from which the Docker file would be accessed. And then the YAML file where all the configuration will end. So at this stage here, we decided to go with YAML, but as we are going into a more production environment, all of those sort of parameters will be kept in our key vault. And then once this is ready, you can just deploy it on your Snowflake service, and off you go. So now everything is run within your Snowflake account really fast and also secure. So all in all, these kind of summarize the benefits we've seen using Snowpark and Snowpark container services. So it meant that there was no data movement. It was all in one secure account. It was efficient. It was scalable, and also it meant that now we could experiment across different robust tools. So next up to you. Cool, thank you, Adil. Um, yeah, so uh, in terms of what we actually achieved um, and, and what our sort of next steps are, some pretty cool achievements, I think, uh, pretty incredible what the team were able to, to deliver in a, a relatively short space of time. So within two quarters, we built tested and productionized the end-to-end -end solution. We now have our skinny marketing campaigns running on the brain. And we are now, as uh, Adele alluded to, we're actually now adopting Snowpark ML across a number of our Spark models as well as skinny. So we're, we're going broader with that adoption. Again, just to put some numbers up and a bit of a recap in terms of, of what we actually did. So around about a billion records that we're processing on a daily basis. We're doing that about six times cheaper than what we were able to do with ADF. The development time across the life cycle, so including feature engineering and, and ML ops, was about 50% faster than what it had been previously. And we actually saw about a 6x performance improvement on the models as well. So what's next? Um, as I mentioned, we're, we're actually going to be shifting some of our key Spark models across into to Snowpark, um, so primarily away from Azure ML, which is what we have been using to date. We'll also be leveraging Snowpipe for data ingestion more broadly. And I'm very excited to, to mention the bottom point there, which is that we're also now running a POC to utilize Cortex along with Streamlit to provide a natural language interface to those skinny marketers. Um, so just to quickly recap, that was the, the basic solution that we were talking about. Um, what we are now doing with our, our POC is extending that. So hot off the press, work in progress. Um, but essentially, this is utilizing Cortex to point to JSON format data that we've got sitting in Snowflake, then providing a natural language interface for our marketers to be able to ask questions and interact with this data. So what postcode has seen the biggest uptake on our $19 plan, for example, getting back uh, both natural language responses, but also visualizing that on a map. Cool. Thank you.